restricted Boltzmann machines. So you want to talk about uh, restricted Boltzmann machines, in particular binary ones. Boltzmann machines are a type of Gibson network or graphical model with a particular architecture. So that architecture is special in two respects. The one is it has two layers of which one layer is visible, so that really carries information about the concrete data that you get, and the other layer is hidden. So that uh, layer is free to develop a representation uh, that helps representing the probabilities and the relationships between the pro uh, values in the input layer, but do not carry information about the data that we have directly. The other special, uh, speciality is that the nodes in the input layer as well as the nodes in the output layer are not connected. One says this is a bipartite graph. Bipartite, bipartite means that you can split it in uh, two groups that are not con connected. And that has the consequence that the nodes are conditionally independent um, given the other layer is instantiated. So if all these units here are instantiated, so they have concrete values, then each node here only depends on the input layer and does not depend on the other units of the hidden layer. And the other way around. So that has a great advantage that you can sample the, that you can sample the input units independently of each other and you can also sample the output units independently of, uh, of each other and that typically happens in a cycle back and forth so you would start initializing the input units then you would sample the output layers independently of each other given the input uh, units or the variables in the input layer and then you would sample the units in the input given the values in the output etc back and forth Now the main advantage of this restriction is that you can make large jumps in state space with one sampling process. I mean in principle you can imagine that these units are all connected with each other and then you can only update one unit at a time but that's not so so um such a problem because I mean you can just also if you sample them um without connections in a program you would go through them one by one right so that's not the point but the point is that this one here can assume a new value only dependent on these units and independently of the other ones so you can have large changes in this layer when you sample while if they were all connected with each other they would constrain each other and would be very difficult to get out of cons uh, of um out of a particular value configuration. So in some sense this network optimizes mixing rate, so there has a large mixing rate, so it moves quickly through the probability distribution that it represents. Often you have models with a lot of input layers, so this is uh, sort of a lot of input units, so you can represent whole images here, so that you would have several hundreds or even thousands of nodes here. So these networks are often very large. So this benefit of having a large mixing rate is particularly important, otherwise you can sample forever. Formally, the probability is given by this equation, so we have a probability of x and h, so we continue distinguishing between the visible layer units, which are indicated by x, and the hidden layer units, indicated by h for hidden, obviously. So we write the probability, so the joint probability of x and h, in this form, 1 over z exponential minus e of x and h. Now this is a way of writing the probability uh, that comes from physics where E would be interpreted as energy. States with high energy, so if this value is high, because of the minus sign the exponential would be low. 
Yeah. So in quantum mechanics, for example, particles tend to go into a low energy state. That's a probable state for the particles. And that would be expressed here. Now, E can have positive and negative values, so it's not constrained, because through the exponential, the values become strictly positive. And that's very convenient. So no matter what you put in here, you get reasonable uh, values that you can interpret as probabilities, and there's no state that is impossible. And that's also often very convenient, that you don't have to take care of zero probability states. Now, as such, this is obviously not normalized, so we divide this by z, which is called the partition function. The z comes from the German word Zustandssumme. Um, so that makes it normalized, and then we have a prob probability. Now, the energy function for a restricted Boltzmann machine is defined as here. So x transpose b, x is the vector of input activities, which we assume to be 0 or 1, right? because it's binary, 0 or 1. And b is a vector of um, parameters. Then c transpose h, so that's um, h are the hidden units, c again is a parameter vector, which is called bias, so c is and C and B are called bias values. And then we have the combination X transpose W H, where W is um, this connectivity matrix. So this would be W, this is H, This is x, and then we have sort of bias values c and bias values b coming from here. No case B. Okay. So we see that the energy function is symmetric with respect to x and h. I mean, the two layers have different roles, but math mathematically they are completely symmetric. Now, if we have that, this one here, it's quite obvious that the Zustandssumme, or partition function, is calculated like that. That would be just the sum over all possible states um, of x and h to normalize this to 1. Now the problem with this partition function is that's normally, except for very small cases, not computable. I mean, if you imagine you have 10 input unit units, you have 10 output units, uh, that are, and you have to go through all the two possible values and all combinations that already would be 20 to the power, 2 to the power of 20 possible terms here, and that's even just a small network, right? So maybe I write this here. Number of x, uh, 2 to the power of number of x, times number of h, States.
Okay, now with these definitions, the first to make, sort of to work with this network is we need to have sort of nice equations for the probabilities of the joint probabilities of X and H and also the marginal probabilities of X and the conditional probabilities. So here we first spell out how the probability of X and H reads. So this is our original definition and then we plug in our definition for E and because E has, as we see here, it has all the minus signs, they are swapped and become positive. So maybe I can write this. Um, okay, so we have this one here. Then we can rewrite this one here. So this is a vector times a matrix times a vector. Yeah. And if we spell this out as a sum, this part here, that would be X transpose WJ HJ summed over J, where WJ are the rows of W. Yeah. And this part here, simply since it's an inner product between C and H, would be just CJ times HJ. So we can combine these two terms into this part here and the H is ends up here and then we sum over J. Now a sum, I mean, this is also sum, right? So sums in the exponential can be written as product of exponentials of the individual terms. Right, so we can take this out here, we write this to the front, and then this sum becomes the product sign as we write the exponential here. Uh, and we will use this way of writing this function um, in future calculations. So this is the joint probability of X and H. So next we look at the marginal of P of X over the hidden variables. So P of X, which is the marginal of P of X and H over the hidden variables. And that's written here. So this is plain Bayesian Bayesian theory here. Uh, so we calculate P of X by marginalizing over H. Now we first replace this by the equation that we've just derived. And then we can take this factor out because it does not depend on H. And we split this sum over H into explicit sums over the individual hidden units H1 to H capital J. Now remember H goes just over two values 0 and 1. Yeah. So here we have the individual sums and we have the, here the, we have the product. Now we can exchange these two and that's similar to the rule that I've given down here. I think it's easiest if you go from this. Uh, imagine you have A1 plus A2 times B1 plus B2 times C1 plus C2. Right? These are the sums over just two values. And then we take the product of these. That's would be this thing, right? This goes over two values and this goes over multiple, in this case three values. Now if you multiply this out, that becomes A1B1C1 plus A1B1C2 plus A1B2C1, etc. So you have all the different combinations and you add over all of these. And that would be completely equivalent to this one. So this represents the local product here. And these are the sums over all the different combinations. That would be all the different combinations here. Yeah? So therefore you can swap the sum and the product sign here. Now we just said H goes just over the values 0 and 1. So if you plug in 0 here, then you have the exponential of 0, which is 1. 
And if you plug in 1, this vector just disappears, and we are left with exponential of cj plus x transpose wj. Now, this is something that can be calculated fairly efficiently, I mean with this product, over the different units of these terms, but we don't have to deal with sort of the, the full combinatorics that we would have here, right? I mean, this would be, if h is 20 different units, that would be 2 to the power of 20 different terms that we would have to calculate, while here we just have to multiply 20 different numbers. Yeah? So this is quite efficient. We can now define something um, yeah, called free energy, again a term from physics. So we can sort of write p of x in a very similar way as we did with p of x and h. Right? So further above we had p of x and h written as 1 over z exponential and then minus an energy. And we write p of x in the same way and the energy that we need now is called free energy. Yeah. So same, same notation, same way as above. Now if we do that, it's relatively easy to relate the free energy and then, and the energy E that we had above. So if you write P of X with the exponential and the free energy, we know this is the sum over P of X and H, and then we can plug in our earlier definition. And if we now apply the logarithm on both sides, we get f of x equals minus ln and then sum of this one here. Okay, so much for the marginal distribution p of x. By the way, the because of the symmetry of the network, p of h could be calculate in a very similar way. Okay, now we look at the conditional of P of, P of H given X. Okay, standard Bayesian formalism gives us this equation, so we divide P of X and H by P of X. And we have both of these expressions, so we plug them in here. Uh, so these are the equations number 7 and 12. Twelve is given here. Yeah. And we see that it has this prefactor, but equation number 7 uh, has the same prefactor. So if we write this if you divide these two terms, you can cancel the prefactors, so the prefactor is missing here. But these are the terms that we have had in the two equations. Now, okay, so we multiply, we have a product of capital J terms, where capital J is the number of hidden units, so let's say it's 10 hidden units, so we have a product of 10 hidden units here, and we have a product of 10 hidden units here. So now we can rewrite this as a product of a fraction of uh, the two terms, right? So we could do something like, so this here uh, would be something like A1 times A2 times a3 divided by b1 times b2 times b3 and this down here would be A, sorry, A1 
A2, A3, B1, B2, B3, Oh no. Yeah. And it's um, quite obvious that this is the same. So this now is the product of P of HJ given X. So this is something that's not quite obvious right now, but will become uh, clear in a minute. So now what does that mean? Well, that means um, that the hidden units are conditionally independent given the visible units, right? So you remember maybe from Bayesian theory that if we have P of H1, comma H2, and if that equals P of H1 times P of H2, then the two variables are statistically independent. Now, normally in a restricted Boltzmann machine, they are not statistically independent, but if X is given, then they are statistically independent, and then the probability of H can be written as the product of the pr probabilities of HJ. Okay, so how can we see that this here holds? Imagine we marginalize over one of the hidden units, h, j dash, and the remaining variable we call h minus j dash. So h is a vector of hidden unit values except for the j dash value. Now, if you want to have p of h minus j dash given x, we have to marginalize over h j dash. So we have to add the probability of the whole h vector. So this is the whole h vector because we have the vector with all, for all hidden units except j dash and we have the value for j dash. And we set this value to 0 given x and here we set it to 1 given x. So we marginalize over h j dash. So this here is P of H given X, where the one visible, u sorry, one hidden unit, J dash assumes the value 1, and here it assumes the value 0. So we can use the equation that we had above, right? So we can use this equation. And that would be pretty much this equation, except that we um, take out the factor where j equals j dash. So we only multiply over those terms where j is not equal to j dash. And this is the term where j equals j dash once for h j dash equals 1 and once for h j dash equals 0. That would be this term and this term. Right? So these terms look identical to this one except that we have a concrete value for this hidden unit. Okay, so now if we plug a 0 here this term would be 1. If you plug a 1 here, this term here, the numerator is the same as this term. So if you take this together, that would be 1 plus this term. So it's the same as this one here. So the whole thing becomes 1. And that means if you marginalize over a single hidden unit, our equation here remains the same, just that we um, 
multiply over one value less, right? Now, if we do this repeatedly, right? If we do this for for all units but one, uh, then for marginalizing over each of the units, we lose one of the product terms, and in the end, if we are only left with one variable, we don't have a product anymore, right? We have just this term here. And that means that this term is P of Hj given x, because Hj is the one that's left over if you have marginalized over all hidden units. Now, if we calculate that for the value 1, right, so if we, so we take this equivalent, so this equals this, and now we put in the value 1. That then would be this one here. And if you write this down, this is the exponential of cj plus x transpose wj divided by 1 plus exponential cj plus x transpose wj, right? This is essentially this term. Now this can be written as a sigmoid function of cj plus x transpose wj, because we have the same argument here and there. And this then can simply be defined as a um, activation function yj of x. Uh, because cj and wj are parameters, they are constants. x is the variable, so we can write this as a function of x. And this is the standard activation function in neural networks. Right? So this is the sigmoid that you can, and it has the following shape This is a value one, right? So this is a standard activation function in um, in neural networks. And this would be m. Yeah, where m so according to this definition. This would be sigma of m. So there's a very nice relationship between the restricted Boltzmann machine and the neural networks, right? So you can, if you go up again to our to this figure, we see that you can interpret this as a neural network where the activities here propagate into the hidden layer and then you use just the standard um, standard activation function of neural networks to determine the probability of this unit to be on. So in a neural network that would be just an activity of 0.7 let's say. In a restricted Boltzmann machine one would interpret this as a probability of this unit to be on which would be 70% or 0.7. Because of the symmetry of the network, you can also do it the other way around. So you can have the activity here in the hidden unit and then propagate the activity down here to the visible units and calculate their activity or their probability to be on in the same way. And there are actually applications where 
one switches between these two interpretations. So first one trains a network, um, a stack of restricted Boltzmann machines, and then switches to a neural network interpretation and uses training algorithms uh, for neural networks. Okay, so now we have the probability, the joint probability for x and h. We have the marginal probability p of x or p of h because of symmetry, it's the same equations. And we have the conditional probabilities p of h given x or p of x given h for the full vector or like here for just a single unit. <laughs> 